Hello and welcome to the first episode of Let's Talk Video. This is a podcast to chat about all things photography, filmmaking, technology and creativity. I'm Cameron O'Connell and today's guest is my good friend Jake Davies. Jake is a London-based photographer and video producer who has worked for a number of festivals around the world, all major London bars and restaurants and an array of corporate work. If you're a London-based creator, you should definitely get to know him. Welcome to the podcast, Jake. Uh, thanks very much. I'm uh, Jake. I am, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, I'm a London-based photographer and filmmaker. Um, huge mix of stuff. Um, I've been doing this for, I probably, I mean, I'm about to turn 26 next week, so I've been doing this for coming up eight years now. Um, but yeah, that's that, that's about it. I mean, I can go into, we'll, we'll go into, I'm sure, who we've both worked with and stuff, but my, my um, main kind of client base is anything from bars, restaurants, I used to be really into nightclubs, but um, I've kind of distanced myself from that a little bit now. Um, and in the last few years, I've been really trying to work with a lot of different corporate companies on their, not brand vision, but where they want to go with what they're doing, as a lot of them kind of are, are the older generation who are you know, just getting to grips with the Facebook and the YouTube and all that kind of stuff. So working with them on how they can best uh, use content to scale their businesses um, and I do that a lot with uh, bars and restaurants as well really so, yeah. nice cool good introduction um, so why don't you tell us first about how you got into the industry yeah so mine was a weird way really um, I kind of um, I was a I was a, a child actor really for a good few years um, what, yeah, what, kind of, what, this, kind of, <laughs> what kind of acting uh, it was a mix, really. I mean, I did a lot of kind of like TV shows, commercials. I did a lot mm. of like presenting work, that kind of stuff. And um, basically, I got together with um, one of my good friends, Alex Sawyer, uh, when we were filming a TV show together. And um, we were both really, really interested in the filmmaking side of everything so because we were always on sets together. And um, we were just really interested in video. Um, and so the first camera I bought was a 5D Mark II. Nice. Canon. Good choice. And uh, yeah, we both, we, yeah, yeah, great. Well, it's an amazing first camera. Um, I always suggest that's the, one of the kind of go-to cameras if you're going to start learning videography because the photography on it is incredible Absolutely, as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, we, we basically, in our naivety at what, 18 years old, we're like, we're going to start a production company. So we bought a bunch of 5Ds um, and just basically taught ourselves how to film and to, I mean, I was more into the filming side. Um, so I, we, we kind of did the film stuff um, and then, you know, just emailed out and reached out to a bunch of people who like, you know, even people that we'd been seeing on, you know, the, the lower end of the TV kind of stuff, like especially with... Um, you know, we had like the voice around and the X Factor and all that kind of stuff. And we were really interested in the acoustic session side of things. Um, didn't really know if we were going to ever make any money out of it. But at that point, we were both on a TV show. So we weren't really that worried. We, we were just kind of doing it for fun. And then the, the videography stuff for me, uh, it kind of snowballed after basically I was doing this production company with him and it was going you know relatively well we were getting bookings which is always good like not loads yeah, yeah. but enough you know cause at, the, at the time I was working for Apple as well so I had kind of like two revenues of income essentially yeah. um, and then um, got more into the video side and then I had I was working <laughs> I was working as a promoter at a nightclub called Mahiki in okay. London and they ba and they were seeing that I was doing video stuff and they were like, oh, can you take photos? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I was like, I'm, I'm learning at least. And they were like, okay, well, we need a photographer for Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Do you want to do it? And I was like, oh, cool. Well, I'll get paid £120 a night to go take photos of girls. I was like, <laughs> fuck yeah, that's a great idea. Like, of like, course I'll do it. <laughs> so anyway, I ended up getting into that. And then that that snowball because when you work in the nightclub industry, you're just consistently meeting new people who are creatives, and you're always meeting new people who are like, "I've got this business, I've got this, I've got this, and we need photos, we need videos for it." And that just ended up being more and more work, more and more work. And as I say, I was working at Apple at the same time, full time, and then it got to the point where I was turning down jobs because I had to go. You know, I was turning down jobs that were two, three hundred pounds a mm -hmm. day. Which, you know, when you start out is good money, like, because you're just like, wow, someone's willing to pay me that just to 
to you, you know do do what I want to do. So I took I was turning down those kind of jobs, and then um, it got to the point where I was just like, uh, you know, I really need to leave this. And then um, another good friend of mine, Harry Russell, um, he's one of the sickest travel, travel videographers yeah ever. we know Harry he's so cool um, he's great yeah Harry's a good guy um, and he yeah he basically turned around and was like look man I'm doing a season in Ibiza this year again I've got loads of really cool clients you know it would be cool if you could come out and do some stuff and it was just at that point I was just like if there's going to be a time where I'm going to take a leap and just go full time freelance then that's this is going to be the mm-hmm. time and I had a bit of money back behind me just to kind of live on for a couple of months. So I just did it. And I did. I worked on and off in Ibiza. Like I, didn't, I didn't do a great deal of work, but it was a really good learning curve because it's the same as with this whole coronavirus stuff. You have loads more time mm-hmm. on your hands. And if you can be creative with the time that you have, then, you know, you, you learn more. So, so I learned, you know, stuff about the cameras I was using not even because I was sh- shooting anything to be paid for it. I was just shooting it because I was bored and I had stuff to do, you know. So, yeah, so, and then, yeah, after after that, I came back to London and I was like, ah, uh, uh, do I need to, do I need to go back to work or, or what do I do? And I just decided to stay freelance and just struggle for a little while and it, and it pays off. Like, as, like, as I say, those nightclub clients really do help if you're, if you're, if you're looking for a way into the industry. Yeah, um, absolutely. They really do because you just you just meet you meet so many people and I mean as long as you're okay doing nights then it's really not it's not the end of the world. Yeah, I mean it sounds kind of similar to, I mean in a way that I kind of fell into the industry and in that I started mm. just by doing favors for friends, and I started exactly, just yeah. shooting anything I could, anyone who had anything mm. interesting to do or any, anything interesting to say. I started making videos Absolutely. and all of a sudden people started to pay attention right yeah because the thing is as well like you don't have to go out and be like i'm a videographer yeah, yeah. now there's no need to do that but but the thing is the more like the, the good thing is now with social media the way that we are is that if you're proud of a project you post it and you're like this is what i've just this is what i've just created and it's guaranteed that someone who's following you or someone who knows someone who's following you needs some form of work done. It's just always yeah, the case. Absolutely. There's someone who always will need something. And that's the, that's the good part about the industry that we're in. It's like being a hairdresser. Like people always need their haircut. People are always going to need video content or photo content. And if you're not too stingy about your prices, because I mean, you, you have to know what you're worth. You have to know what, and, and you have to know what other people are roughly charging yeah, yeah. for it. And it's not, you, you have to know how much, you know, what you feel like your stuff's worth. But it, it's about working with the person who needs this, this thing done and being like, okay, cool. Well, I'm going to, you know, I'm just starting out. So I'm going to give you what I would consider is a good rate for you. But then equally, I know how, how long this is going to take me to edit and I know how much, how much camera equipment I'm going to need. And a lot of the time when I get booked onto any bigger project, you know, it's often they'll be like, okay, cool. This is our mm-hmm. budget. And then you're like, okay, well, I don't have that piece of equipment. So you actually, you end up using the money that you've, that you're going to, that you're getting for the project to buy equipment to even do the project. And I think that's what a lot of people don't bear in mind is that actually a lot of the, it, it's not just I'm turning up to do this job and then you're paying me the money. It's actually, well, I've got to pay for this and I've got to pay for this and I've got to pay for this and I've got to pay for this, you know, it all adds up. And yeah, exactly. Up. And it's all a long-term investment, really. So, like the amount of times I've, yeah, it's, it, of, the amount of times I've spent more money on, a piece of gear for a shoot mm. then you know I don't actually make any profit you know like that happens all the time yeah, but yeah. it kind of but it, it levels it, you up in ways doesn't it, 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 it yeah it comes back to you, it comes back to you fourfold like you know a lot of people are always like oh well, you know how much is that camera yeah, yeah. worth and you know a, 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 a Sony a7 III will cost you three, three mm-hmm. grand four grand whatever something, something like that but the amount of money that you make out of it is it completely outweighs the cost and it, it is often a, a matter of people come and say oh I need a good first camera because I want to get into this and it's like yeah. okay well you can go and buy an 800 pack you can buy it go and buy yourself an 800 pound camera and it will do okay for that job but when that next person is like no this you know a client will always send you a video and say we want something like this straight away you can look at it and know whether or not your camera is capable of shooting that or yeah. not you know and especially now, now owning the red it's one of those things that you know, people will come to me and be like, "Okay, this is what we want to go mm-hmm. for," and they'll send me a, a they'll send me a promo made by Adidas. Yeah, yeah. And this, and I know what cameras they I know what cameras they've shot. <laughs> they'll send me TV shows, and they'll be like, "This is what we want shot." 
you're never going to get that with lower yeah. end cameras because they're just not capable of it and you know it's about lighting and it's about all the other stuff but you you also have to you, when buying a camera it is an investment and it's something that's gonna it's gonna have to last you you know most of my cameras will last me at least three or four years before i decide that i need to new that's one it, man. it's like, it's like buying like, a car right you, you don't buy it with the intention yeah, of, of replacing course. it in six months you just do it in no, stages course, yeah, and yeah. levels and you think well if i spend this amount of money on this camera now then it should last me this long and then i can continue to move on but um going back yeah, to absolutely. your point on you mentioned about nightclubs and working in yeah. ibiza and you said that you've chosen mm. to move away from nightclubs tell me more about that yeah um i, I the, so the thing is with the thing is with um Restaurants are a little bit different because restaurants seem to have like just slightly bigger budgets, and I you can tend to charge um, a little yeah, bit more. Yeah. But with the night with with the nightclub industry and any any kind of parties or nightlife, there's a very set rate on what people are willing to mm-hmm. spend, and they they know for a f- like it's it, with them it's more about quantity than quality. So it's like a lot of nightclub videographers and photographers will be frustrated because they're all about quality and if and if, if it's a piece of your work like most of us tend to be perfectionists to yeah, an extent yeah. um so we're more like okay well i want to get paid this because this is the quality you're going to get it's going to be a much better quality than someone who's just come out of university and needs their first job whereas they're looking for someone who is going to do something relatively cheap because they they want more of it so you know one nightclub may pay you three hundred pounds just for one yeah, night, yeah. but then another an, another nightclub might want someone who is uh, less experienced, but they want them a hundred pounds per night. So they have three night they get three nights worth of stuff out of them. I mean, no, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, it, it depends. It it, it it depends what business you're running. Personally, I mean, I think it's good I, because I, there's different I, there's different sort yeah. of levels of who's willing to work for what and. Yeah, you know that was probably course. you in the early days, right? Working for a hundred pound a night. Yeah, you know I've have done a yeah, I've done absolutely. a little bit of nightclub work, and personally for me, it's it's not really the money's not really the problem for me. It's more the hours that you're there till like four in the morning or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I as I say, I think the nightclub industry, if you if you're looking to 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 get paid for something that is going to be. If you're looking, if you're looking for a way in, into doing videography, it's a re- or photography, it's a really, really good way to get in because you basically have night after night of practicing with your camera, and you're in really challenging con- conditions. Yep. Like, it, like the, 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 the like shooting nightclubs is actually really difficult mm-hmm. because you really have to you you have to have a really good understanding of lighting, um, and. The, the longer you're in it the more you get bored of just the standard speed light on the top because you only get one kind of image from it and then you start doing off camera flashes then you have giant ring lights and then there's there's you there's a way that you learn more about lighting because you're you get bored of shooting the yeah, same yeah. stuff oh is it, is it photo basically. you do so, more than video for nightclubs um for now now I only do videos right, in nightclubs okay. but I don't actually really do them anymore there's only really one nightclub that I do and that's just because they're willing to pay me the fee that I ask yeah, yeah. for um, and and they live five and it's five minutes away yeah, from my cool. house, so I'm like willing to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, like we, I've never found, I've never thought I'm a very good nightclub photographer. To be fair to myself, like I've never been the best. There's other there's other photographers who I know who I'm in like WhatsApp groups with, and we all kind of chat about it. Who are very good at, they're very very good at nightclubs I'm not the kind of person who'll go up to people and pull them and be like, you need to stand in front of yeah, this yeah. wall so I can take photos of you. I like the more kind of like natural stuff and I feel like that's why videography works for me better because I can stand at the other end of a club with a 24, uh, so 7200 and I can get really good footage without actually disturbing anyone, you no, know? I hear exactly what you're kind saying. Kind of more like a, like, like a, like a ninja <laughs> photographer basically. Um, I, that's the route I prefer, but some photographers are really good at just walking up to girls and being like, you're coming with me, I'm taking photos and they, the images they get are, are the ones that get you know the the biggest applause essentially that's it, man, like they're yeah. the ones that get posted on the Instagrams think, and the, you know and that's where you that's yeah. the best marketing content is you want you know that's I think you, you really have to enjoy sort of nightclubs as a whole because I really yeah. don't oh, yeah. and and that's why I, I'll never do them well, oh, mate when I was when I was <laughs> yeah. 18 I loved it but now, no, maybe but not, now I'm yeah. to you know now I'm to now, yeah now I'm just like okay cool well this you know I don't want to be out until four in the morning yeah. right but some people no. love it I did I did love it 
I loved it six years ago. I don't I love it anymore. Exactly and that's saying, yeah. that is 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 the com- is the combination of the bad working hours and the um and the the low low pay. I would say it's not low, but it's you know it's it's not great. You you have to really enjoy it to be like ah well at least I'm earning money. Yeah, for it. I hear what like, you're saying. Whereas now na- get whereas you know. I'll still do nightclub stuff if the money's good but then if I know I've got to get up at nine in the morning it makes it way less fun yeah you know? good point um, and also and, and also if you're sober in nightclubs it's even worse people, it's yeah fucking difficult. exactly and you it's can't so be difficult. in so every you're, night you're also, well, well, that's that's the thing. You, it's actually really hard to to go to a nightclub and shoot people if you're not a bit yeah, drunk I yourself agree. so it's <laughs> if you if you've got if you've got that um if you've got that freedom to go there, get drunk, get, get great images, I always think I'm the better photographer when I'm drunk, to be fair. People are like, oh, are the photos blurry? It's like, no, that's what autofocus is for. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's not point it. Of it. Um, Cool. So just moving on. Um, how do you find your clients? Tell us that. So, I mean, I've, I've never really pushed, um, pushed at all for, for, for new clients. I don't really do any any kind of ads or anything yeah, yeah. like that all of mine really cut all of mine comes from world, word, word of mouth, mouth and that's yeah. why that i say that 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 whole um the whole nightclub industry stuff is you know is really good because you do you just naturally meet clients yeah, yeah. so you meet them really easily because as i say people always need something um it tends to always be through word of mouth with me and i've been really fortunate with it um but yeah it's it, it it's all. It's. I, I've always. I say. I've always been really fortunate with whoever I've worked with. Like everyone's yeah, always great, been man. quite it's nice. The same with but me. I also. Yeah. I. I, I, yeah. I just sort of I fall into I, I think it. it's somehow somewhere. Someone needs something doing. Someone. And I get. Yeah. I get suggested onto a job, and then I meet someone else on the job, and then they invite yeah. me on another well, project. Exactly, yeah. Right. It's all the same. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's even like the one that, like that, that job that I met you on the one where we went to Amsterdam, like that was through a, um, through like an events agency. Oh, really? They're not even, an, it's, just, it's, it's like an events company basically. And um, I, she booked me to shoot the client's birthday party. And then through that, I met the client. And then through that, you get a, jo- a big job. Oh, nice, cool. like, So it, it, it's, it's, it, you, you meet people in random in random ways but when you do they can be yeah, really yeah exactly and for me on and and, and good to have. for me in, in that exact example on that job uh the client was a guest at another event that i just got chatting to and yeah ended up going drinking with and then all of a sudden yeah <laughs> i'm in amsterdam with you right but no man that's really yeah, cool man. um <laughs> tell me where do you see yourself in the future what do you love and hate about our industry? Mm. Difficult. I can hear you guys talking there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, the, 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 go, the going forward ones always is quite hard because it's, it's, this is a reason why I got the red, really, mm-hmm. is um, it's, really, it's, hard to, it's hard to work out once you've done this where your next step is because actually after you've done this for so long and you have a good group of clients and they're all paying you money regularly, it's really hard to then want to jump into something like TV or want to jump into bigger projects because actually you kind of have to start from the bottom yeah. again. Um, and after, you know, after doing it for, you know, six, seven years or, you know, even four or five years to, to go back to the beginning is, is quite a hard pill to swallow. Um, so like I, I know you're having um, I know you're having a conversation with Stefan. I'll be really interested to to hear his his kind of journey on how he got to where he is because essentially that's kind of where I would like to go. Okay. Um, I think I think but he's, then, but then a, hand, he's a, an example we'd all quite like to see ourselves yeah, in the near future. I mean, yeah. Yeah, but I, he, you know he works on really good pro- like my 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 next move ideally would be to instead of doing the beginning to the end of the project so doing the planning the shooting the editing and you know all of it would be to be doing small parts so be to do the dop part and just do the filming or do do to do the the editing part do that i'm really getting into animation at the moment so i'd quite like like to do some more work from home but i mean i don't i don't see myself living in the uk in the next you know when i'm in in four years i'd quite like to move abroad and at that point i think i'd probably like to start something new um and i don't know whether that would be you know some form of management uh in you know in in this kind of industry so like 
um, working with other photographers and videographers, sending them on jobs, you know, kind of creating like a production company yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and just doing the management part or, um, or whether or not it just be something totally random. But um, you never really know, do you? Because you know, like, a, new, yeah. a new technology could come our way. And it could just change yeah. the way that we work day to day, right? Yeah, it's it, it, it's really it's, it's definitely interesting. Like, I mean, it's interesting to see where everything's going to go. Um, I, I I do I enjoy my job. Like, I'm, I don't mind it. Um, but it, it, in the last two years, it has felt like a job rather than what it felt like yeah, five like years passion, ago. Like five years project. ago, was, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, and it's. And also, it's hard to it's hard to really um, it's hard to really what's the word? It's hard to really like keep that creativity when you go into everything thing new, especially when you know you you quite quickly after a few jobs learn what what looks good on camera and what doesn't look good. So it's quite easy to kind of use that as a template for the next place. So if you're shooting a bar and restaurant, like you know exactly what what what's going to look good, and then. The next video you do looks exactly like the last one you did. It's just a different venue and different people. So it's hard to. I find I find that's what you're quite good at. Is all of your jobs kind of seem to look different, which is like they they've got your stamp as like the way you shoot yeah, yeah. it. But you really work on your angles and you work on different things. Whereas a lot of my stuff, you could see two different two different jobs and they could be basically the same shot list. You, you mean know? like a template? So yeah. I, I, so what you mean. I, yeah exactly yeah so I, that's something I personally struggle with but at the end of the day if a client looks at my work and they say we really really like that we want you to do that for our bar they're, they're getting what they've asked for you know so it's kind of like it's about trying to pull creativity yeah, even yeah. you might be tired or you know or the lighting shit and it's just a lot of but work but like going back to um, the so template sort of idea you had um, yeah I don't know do you not think maybe that's just the way you see your work I definitely, definitely, yeah, because yeah. Because I don't more, more, more. more yeah, I, I mean, so, because yeah. we do mostly client work. I don't really think many others see our work in like a consistent um, rhythm yeah. of kind of oh, there's the same thing yeah. as last week. And Absolutely, we do it because yeah, it speeds yeah. it speeds up our production, right? I do it all the time. I do an intro. I do a time lapse. I do sort of like something in the middle and then I do an outro it's kind of you've got to have a template <laughs> yeah. at some point right like yeah to an extent yeah to and an like, extent. I heard an analogy once yeah. about like uh, you know like businesses around the world are all using templates in, in some sense you know even like someone yeah. like a lawyer you know if you walk into mm. a a lawyer's office and say oh I've got this problem with this their go to to save time will be to go through all their other yeah. cases they've had, pull out one the yeah, most course, similar, change the name and hand it over, right? So Yeah, of course, of course. I don't know, don't don't feel bad yeah, about I, it. I, I, you know, your work feeling no, like No, no, oh it's not that. You know, you're being too repetitive. Yeah, I think that's normal, mate. Yeah. Like, and I don't think any other yeah. others see I, it that way. Yeah, I think the the other thing with me is that I don't post any of my work on social media, so I don't. Use, so like, my, if you go to my Instagram, yeah, my yeah. Instagram is just loads of photos of me. No, it, I hear it, what loads you're of photos of me on holiday because because that's what I like to keep. As my, I, that's what I like my the aesthetic of my socials to look yeah, like. Yeah. If you go to my website, if you go to my website, you'll see a list of all my work, and you'll be able to what you would be able to see it. But and why, why is I that? will probably turn because you think that your client works. No, it's not that. Um, or it's not I like consistent I think enough. When, Is that the problem? I, I think it's just when I when I was making a decision as to whether or not I was going to post my work on my Instagram, it was I knew I didn't want to put because the thing is I'll probably turn around about fourteen videos a month, fifteen videos a month, maybe. That's pretty good. Not around, on that's, pre- that's a lot. Yeah. More oh yeah. Well, that, well, well, that, but that, but that's the thing. But that's the thing. Like, I, I, like if anyone anyone who knows me knows that I do work a yeah, lot. Yeah. Like I do a lot of jobs. That's good, man. Like, well, in, in, in each in in yeah in, in each month, I've normally got about five or six projects that I'm that I'm doing or editing, and then as soon as that one's done, another two come on, and then I get rid of two, and then you know I'm I'm always working consistently. Um, but a lot of the stuff, like it's it's good and it looks great, but it's not, you know, no one wants to see. It's not like, really relevant, yeah. No one wants to see. A, no, no one wants to see a corporate dinner. I did, they're, you know, for up for, yeah, yeah. for me, they're boring as hell. For the client, they're they're really interesting because yeah, yeah. they they don't actually get videographers around a lot. So 
for the client, they're like, wow, this is a really good video. You've done a really good job. But for me, I'm just like, I wouldn't want to sit and watch. Yeah, no, I see exactly what you mean because you know, I, I, I've been, uh, you know, I've been very and, similar in my own way that I used to only post the exciting kind of stuff exactly, I was yeah, actually yeah. kind right. of happy to represent my brand. But more recently, yeah. I've kind of gone the other way in the sense that I don't really care anymore. Yeah, just post. But what everything I've been trying to do is, I just, good to I just up. post something every day now, whether it's mm. good or whether it's shit or doesn't really matter. I just post yeah. something so that it pushes me to create more. Have you have you found that your your following or your your insights have boosted since you've done that? Um, I mean, that's kind of hard to judge because I don't really look at like analytics or. Um, yeah. I don't know, like my clients don't really come to me in like that sense, or at least not through Instagram. But what I yeah. have found is the projects that I post that I expect to get the attention are never the projects that get any attention. It's actually, Do you get what I mean? Yeah, wow, that's interesting. So like, yeah, that's interesting. For an example would be like, so I, I shot a recruitment video for well, a recruitment advert for Nielsen Holidays. Um, they're okay. an activity-based um, holiday company in Greece. And mm-hmm. it's like the coolest job you could ever have, you know, living on the beach and yeah. having a good time. I was about to say, it sounds It good, was right? good. It was amazing. <laughs> um, and I got, like, to spend three months in Greece basically doing whatever I wanted just to create uh, a recruitment video. I spent yeah. months editing it and I was super relentless on like making it perfect and I finally got it out. I was I was never going to be happy with it entirely. You know, mm. and I released it to the world and no one cared. It got like 30 likes or something. Oh, it's so frustrating, I know, isn't right? it? And then I'll get like a random I'll get so like a random call from like a a pizza restaurant, right? And I'll, I'll just no, go and take those. some quick like uh, photos of some pizza on like a table with no no lighting and only natural lighting. Yeah. Spend 20 yeah. minutes on the edit, put them up and then get five jobs booked. But yeah, that's kind of what I've learned recently that um, just because something is like important and interesting to you doesn't mean it's interesting to the yeah. masses, you know, like. I'll find, yeah. like you said, because it's food, everyone can relate to food. So it kind of makes sense. But if I actually look at how much yeah. work I put into that project compared to the recruitment video, it was just so yeah. frustrating to see how much attention such a, you know, a simple little job that I put no, no effort yeah. into compared to something I put mm. all my efforts and my passion into. So yeah, well, do you know what that is? It's it, but that that is that, that's another interesting. Th- so uh, going back to why I don't post yeah, yeah. my work on socials. So like I was going through a stage where I was thinking, okay, maybe I should create just a work based account, but I didn't want to have to rebuild. Yeah, I agree. An Instagram following, like my 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 Instagram following is not huge. It's like five, like just under five thousand or right. something. But even fi- having having five thousand people is like that's there, and me having to. I, what I've seen for most videographers who I know whenever they've created a secondary account they haven't even got a quarter of that following so actually it's better to make the decision right do I go full on and just push my yeah, yeah. push myself as a business on Instagram or do I just keep that separate and just keep a website which is where which is like kind of the route I've gone down um, but it's actually interesting like again like with you know I, I just did a job for TikTok in Brazil okay um, and that was like and that video was like great like i mean the content was incredible and i posted it and it got a really good reaction no jobs from it though but then i posted a few corporate headshots that i did that i was proud of on my story and i was like by the way i'm offering corporate headshots like just because i thought these are actually all right they're pretty easy to do i'll just do it posted that and i got like four bookings from it for corporate headshots. there we go yeah and they're the one and they're the one and they're the ones who have the money yeah it's true yeah it's <laughs> so, true yeah yeah you know it's 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 one of those things so be i get i get what you mean it's definitely interesting but yeah it's just funny how i've gone the other way in a sense that i'll just post anything whether it's you know a crappy corporate job about data i'll just post 10 of my best b-roll shots without any audio or any grade yeah up to instagram takes me probably less than five minutes mm. 
and all of a sudden people are aware that you, I'm even busy it. and doing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I was guilty of like not posting for months. You know. Yeah. It's just difficult. I, I, I just go just quickly. What one more thing on that? Like the thing that I find difficult is that I mean, it's all good. like this whole coronavirus stuff is great for creativity because we all have a shitload of time on our hands, and we're and we're, yeah. we're able to really kind of analyze what we've been doing right and what we've been doing wrong. But like during when when I hit you know busy peak season and you know it's for me it's normally May June May June July for me is crazy like it's absolutely mad. Um, when I hit that time, like uh, other than the edits that I'm able to give to the client, I don't really have any other time to edit anything else. Like I'm so backed up. Like at, 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 yeah, at, yeah. at, at points, I've got like you know a list of say ten videos that all need editing, and for me, they just need to get turned around as quick as they can, as creatively as they can, and get to the client. And then I have to go on to the next thing on the list. So it's. For for someone like me who you know does a lot of small jobs, because uh, you, yep. I find there tends to be two kind of videographers in this world. There tends to be the people who do less jobs for more money, so they'll do the big one week jobs for five k or whatever. And then you have other, yep. and I'll still do those if I'm offered them. But other than that, I'm just like right, okay, three hundred pound job here, four hundred pound job here, five hundred pound job here, job here, job here, hundred fifty pound for this. Da, 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 da. Like I just try and cram everything in, and and you know just do as much as i possibly can um but again that only uh, that that helps with the snowball effect right with the, with the meeting new people because the more jobs yeah, you yeah. do more jobs you do the more people you meet and then you know it just carries on so no i hear what you're saying yeah um so yeah moving on why or no really the question is the question i had was do you need a cinema camera no and that's the question i have <laughs> asked myself many times no no, you don't. And I thought about, like, what actually is a cinema camera? Yeah. And if you really think about it, it's just a video camera, right? It is, yeah. In fact, I think there are two, maybe three things, I think, that in my eyes symbolise a video camera. Mm. And that is one being the unlimited record time, mm-hmm. which would have helped me today. Um some kind of log high dynamic range picture profile yep and a codec that has good enough bit rates so that you're able to grade the image how you would like without yeah. restriction yeah don't know what are your what are your thoughts on that that's just like three that I've come up yeah, with yeah I mean I absolutely agree with all of them um that's definitely the case um it's. I've never really been too technical with ca- like with cameras. Like I know my way around my. Yeah, yeah. I know my way around my cameras really well. So I feel like when I got the red, it was a really good tool for me to learn a lot more. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you should like? Do you need to own a cinema camera? No, definitely not. Um, it's, but it is fun to have one. It's great to have one. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to focus my ownership of one now more into rentals than I am physically shooting on one. Um, yeah, that's and, a good idea. and a lot of jobs that I have had come in, uh, the more exciting ones at least, it's nice to be able to be like, cool, well, I own a red, so I can I can shoot on that. Because, and you know, the, the client really doesn't care, let's be honest. Um, they just want a good image. Um, I, I often find- it's true. I often find that when I'm shooting the Sony against the red, um, I notice a sizable difference in the quality, um, yeah, yeah. which I would expect because one's worth three thousand and one's worth twenty eight thousand. Um, <laughs> so you do notice a sizable difference as a filmmaker, as a client. Yep. As a client, you probably wouldn't notice that much of a difference. Um, hence the reason why I'm trying to move more into that. It's like the you know the Brazil, the TikTok Brazil job I just did. I would have loved to have shot that in the red. I feel like the, the what I what physically what I was shooting would have looked incredible, you know, two hundred and eighty frames a second on two hundred and forty frames a second. Like it would just look beautiful. But yeah, yeah. I was shooting on I was shooting on my Sony I took my Sony because one the chance of things being stolen were very, very high. So like the photographer I was working with, I was the videographer, the he was the photographer. Yeah, yeah. The photographer had his phone stolen, like literally two days into the trip. Oh damn! Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the yeah, the idea of bringing a red to Brazil yeah the the, 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 <laughs> the risk 
the risk did not outweigh it even though i have insurance it's not it's not worth just being like i have insurance so if anything goes wrong i'll be fine it's not worth it because every time you do that insurance claim your insurance premium goes up and then it's just not worth it right you should you should only ever really use those kind of cameras if you're in a secure yeah. in a secure environment and you, you don't know you don't know you're covered no either with insurance of like, course not insurance companies know how to get you yeah and of course they will find the loophole if they, yeah, if they can absolutely and it's not it's not a risk that's worth £28,000 it's just not worth it but, yeah you know. um, no I hear you so, so I would have absolutely loved to have shot on that but I shot on the Sony and the video came out great but it came out exactly the way my head expected it to because I've shot on Sony for so okay. long I knew the way yeah, yeah. I knew the way the footage would look before I even before I even shot it right because you just know the way your camera cool. you just know the way your camera looks I would have loved to have what shot what was the project um, so it was filming um it was filming for uh tiktok in brazil at carnival in salvador filming a influencer marketing campaign between uh influencers and tiktok so basically they flew a bunch of influencers out said you're going to get free accommodation and a free ticket to go to carnival and you have to post loads of stuff on tiktok so it's just boosting basic tiktok's branding and getting them out as many people as they can but that's tiktok in brazil um, so I was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. My name is great job. It's good client. The client I'm working with are an influencer marketing uh, group, and they're just fucking wicked. They give me loads of work, and they're the projects are all really yeah, nice. Re- one. They're they're really interesting. And in this whole coronavirus stuff, um, they've actually given me quite a lot of uh, animation work and editing to do, which has kept me busy, which is nice. Um, That's good. But yeah, having a, having a red is cool. It's good to ha- it's it's a cool thing to own. Um, a few. Basically, last year, I was at the point where I was like, right, okay, I've got enough money if I wanted to get a mortgage. But then I was like, I don't ever want to live in the UK. And even if I buy a house, it's going to be way more money to, like, you know, furnish it and make it good for someone to live in. And then a pipe burst, and that's another £600. So it was one of those things I was like, do I want to own any property right now? And I was like, not really. Um, I'd rather just buy a house in a few years and live in it. Um, but that wouldn't be in the UK. So I was like, I had a bit of money and I was like, right, what do I do? And then I had this conversation with my friend Keaton and he was like, you should just go for it. He's like the worst, he's like the worst person for uh, for like, yeah, you should get it. Just do Advice. it. Just do it. Don't worry about <laughs> do, do it. Don't worry about it. Um, he so, tells you what you want to hear, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's like, and then like a week after we go into like a camera shop and we're looking at cine lenses and it's like 10,000 pounds for three cine lenses. And I was like, should I get them? And he's just like, yeah, you should just get them. And I was like, this is what happened with the red, bro. <laughs> it's like you're, supposed to, you're supposed to say no, you don't need them. But yeah, having a cinema camera is great. It's good to own one and it's fun to shoot projects on it. I learned a lot by buying it, like just as in using it. Um, and the reason why I went for the red, yep. the w- reason why I went for the red is because it was just significantly cheaper than going for an Arri, like an Arri Mini, an Alexa Mini, which is what Stefan owns. Like, I mean, your, your base rate is like six fifty grand, sixty grand, and I just wasn't going to spend any. Yeah, it's too much. Did, yeah, it's just too it's it's too much when I'm not shooting the projects that he's shooting. You know, so for me, it's, yeah, yeah. for me, it's cool to have one. When you, whenever you go to a project, I shot Budapest on it. Whenever you walk into a room with a red camera, everyone loses their shit because they just can't believe you have one. That part of it's cool, but is it worth that amount of money? Maybe not. And also, you don't really notice. I mean, they always say that your glasses is as important as your camera, and it's absolutely true. Like, I mean, you don't notice the significant dynamic range it has until you put cine lenses on it. If you're just throwing Canon lenses on it, you'll still get a good result because it is the camera at the end of the day that's that's taking in the information. But if you throw cine, yeah, yeah. when you throw cine lenses on it, it just completely changes the. And I've been trying to look for, hmm. a, I've been trying to look for a decent anamorphic lens that I can buy that's not yeah, yeah. that's not going to you know bankrupt me. Um, that as that I could just use as a normal go to lens. And at the moment, I just use the. When you when I bought the kit, it comes with a sixteen to thirty five Sony, uh, not Sony, uh, uh, Sigma thirty five. Sigma, yeah, Sigma. And Art, I mean, yeah. people have been using those for the last year, and they're they're great. They're great. Such a great lens. Yeah, it yeah it's a brilliant lens. Um, I just. I mean, I've I've never shot I've never shot cine lenses to be honest. Yeah, but um, but again, so I, I can't really put too yeah. much input into again, that. Again, when but, it, when it when it comes to you know, I would have loved to film that TikTok Brazil job on that red. But now I look back on it, it just would have been impossible. I would have ended up putting it back into the yeah, case yeah. and getting the Sony out because I was just running it like it's not a run and gun camera. It can be, but it has to be a run and gun camera that is very. You have to have 
in place what you're going to shoot because as well one yeah. one battery will last you an hour which is all right but then it takes if you think about when you're you know i i, I don't I, my friend keaton he literally just leaves his he leaves his sony on like even when he's not filming he just leaves it on and it will last hours and hours and hours but when you when you've got <laughs> a, day, when, yeah, you know, more or less. when you've got a red you really have to plan it because it takes 30 seconds to turn the fucking thing on like it takes yeah that's true man you know so it's like someone and like, that that was my fear yeah that yeah. was my fear of owning a cinema camera that I thought it was just going to slow me down. Yeah, and it does. And but it's good that, when, when, you, when you're shooting, it's good it that you're embracing both. Yeah. You know, you're shooting on the a, A7 III and what is it, the Red Weapon? Dr- or the Red, Red, Red Dragon 5K. So, Red yeah. Dragon. So, yeah, okay. it's, it's a cool thing to own. I don't regret buying it at all. Um, it is an investment. Like, when I, I'm going to shoot on it as much as I can for the next few years, and then probably in two or three years, I'll probably sell it. Um, I'll get, obviously, less yeah, yeah. less than I paid for it, but still it's not it's it's a D, uh, dsmc2 so it's not going to go out of fashion anytime soon people are still going to be using it yeah, yeah but now for me it's about reaching out to production companies who like uh, what i would like to do which is what i'm kind of doing at this point is offering a lower rental cost for people who are looking to not only not move into it like but essentially they've never shot on a they've never shot on a cinema camera before and they want to yeah, but, but you know, learn how to use it, and they want to do it without knowing they they're spending say three hundred pounds a day on it. So I offer like a videography rate for people who are, you know, new to the cinema cameras, and offer them a rate that is like say they're shooting say they're shooting interviews or something, uh, for, say they're shooting corporate interviews, offer them a day rate when they know they're only getting five hundred pounds, six hundred pounds for the day, but offering a, a rental yeah, yeah. a rental rate that is they know they're not losing half of their money for it you know because it's true yeah cause I mean the, I've, I've never rented a camera yeah before. I mean the, the, rent, the rental cost on I the, probably never will the, yeah the standard unless I have to <laughs> the standard rental cost on a red is around about two, anywhere between 250 and 350 a day so I'm trying yeah. to offer it about 150 a day but only doing it to people that I trust and people who I know or yeah, yeah. who have been vetted by fellow videographers or whatever um and have a, have rental insurance and all that kind of stuff because you even even when you're doing a rental you still that that person still has to have rental insurance because if anything goes wrong with it it has to go through their insurance first before it goes through yours so it's oh okay so that's interesting yeah so it's not it's not like i have rental insurance and i can give it to you know whoever you are and if you drop it in yeah, water yeah. it cut it's covered by my rental insurance if they don't have insurance then your insurance is void so it's pointless um, yeah. So that's how they. That, but, but going back to um, going things. back to you said earlier about client perspective, mm. um, and you said that you don't think the client really cares all that much. They just want a good image. I mean, unless you're unless you're working with someone who really understands cameras, um, yeah. they haven't got a clue. But it, 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 as I said, well, like, like I yeah, go on. like I said to you earlier, a lot of the work I get actually comes from other filmmakers, right? And I feel like my chance of them hiring me for a project, having shot on a DSLR, mm. is quite slim compared to if I owned a cinema camera of some sort. Yeah, I feel like it would put me in a league, in their opinion. Yeah, I mean, I. So t- they're more likely to hire me. Yeah, I. I, I do you think that's a thing? Yeah, I know. I, d- I definitely do. I definitely do. Um, I think that because most of my work comes from clients directly, so people will contact me directly. Yep. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, maybe you, you're working with filmmakers, I suppose, that are more, I don't know. Yeah. A, a, a restaurant isn't gonna give, give a fuck what camera I have, basically. No, no, but, absolutely but, not. But, uh, but a, a, a fellow videographer might respect you slightly more because you own it and they don't have to pay for it, I guess. Um, yeah, or maybe, maybe it's because they, they think that, or say like you didn't know me and I, and you were looking for a camera operator to shoot a project for you. Yeah. If you ask me what camera I own, yeah. it'd probably tell you a lot about how invested I am into the industry. Yeah, true. And into what I do. Yeah. And I, I kind of feel that way a little bit. Like if I, if I need something small doing and I put a post up, to other video creators and someone's shooting on like a I don't know a Canon 60D six, 600D right yeah you're like no I know instantly exactly what I'm getting yeah. and I know who I'm dealing with yeah of course they might be really good but chances are they're probably not yeah well, but I know if well, they're at, shooting on at least, the imi- at least the image quality won't be up to the standards that you expect 
Yeah, I mean, even if I was going to lend them a camera, I I feel like the camera you own says a lot about kind of where you are in your career in the industry. Yeah, I would say that. In a sense. Yeah, I agree. Not not in every sense. But that's why, like, but, I mean, I was quite impressed because I, I mean, I, I started in Canon and then I just, I, I didn't go for, say, the one the uh, 1DX Mark II. I went for the Sony and then once you kind of get invested in a brand, it's hard to move out because then you've got to change your glass, you've got to change your no, that. Absolutely stuff. Is, but yeah. I was really impressed with the quality of the 1DX Mark II when I saw you filming on it. Um, but with your whole setup with the Ronin S and then you have like your monitor and all the other stuff, I was, re- and it's the same with Theo, our friend Theo, like I was really impressed with the quality that came out of the, of those cameras. And I've often, you know, I, I, ju- yeah, yeah. I just did, I just did a project with Theo and he shot on the 1DX and I shot on the Sony. And it, nice. it, I I sometimes feel with the Sony, I'm kind of, uh, how do I explain it? I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get the best out of it, but sometimes it's it's I make it more difficult for myself. Whereas the way the setup yeah, yeah. The, the setup that you and Theo have with your Canons kind of seems stupid proof. Like it's like you're always ready to go, if that makes sense. Like it's, yeah, you're, no, that's true. You're, you know, it's like someone could be like run over there in five seconds and go film that, and you're literally like da 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 da. Whereas I, I am to an extent, but it's like. I've got the Ronin MX and I have to fucking set it up and I have to pick it up and then the balance sometimes is not is a bit yeah. off and all this kind of stuff. So, that, yeah, no, exactly. You know, so I did. Uh, uh, I mean, it depends how well you know your camera. I guess. Yeah, yeah, I guess. But I've been shooting on the Sony. And like, I've been. I've been shooting on the Sony. Yeah, now I've been for shooting Canon years. for probably about ten years now. Yeah. So you go. And the menus have not changed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the principles are all more or less the same. What advice would you give a soon-to-be first-time red owner? Ooh. Uh, someone who's someone who's bought or someone who's thinking of buying. Um, thinking of buying, I reckon. I think if you're thinking of buying one, uh, just be aware that it's cool. You know. It is, it's a limiting camera. You really have to plan what you're shooting with it. Um, you really mm-hmm. have to know that you, you have to know that it's going to, um, you have to know that the project that you're going to be shooting can even be shot on it because there's some things that you can, sh- like there's just no way you would ever be able to shoot it on a, in a run and gun situation. It's just not, it's just not practical. Um, yeah. But you know, if you're, when you own a red you can definitely you know hype your prices up a bit and change your branding so it's like you're you're a cinema, cinematographer you can definitely make it sound a little bit more professional rather than like oh I'm just this person with a DSLR um, cause it, and you can definitely make your projects bigger um, but it really is you know if you're about to spend all this money on it be prepared for that money to not really be worth anything if that makes sense like if I compare how much money I've earned from my Sony a7 III and the cost of it, and then compare that to the money that I've earned from the red, there's no comparison. The, you know, the, oh, okay. it, it, re- yeah. it really, you know, it really, uh, unless you've got the clients, if you've got the clients who are willing to it's spend true, yeah. thousands and thousands and thousands on projects, you know, like what, I mean, in a, as a good scenario, you know, one of my friends came to me and he was like, uh, I want to shoot a short film. It has to be shot on a red, um, you're the first person I thought about because you own one, so it makes sense. So for that, in those kind of situations, you know, I'm getting booked because I have a red, because otherwise, if we wanted to do a two or three week shoot, he'd be looking at five, at, you know, minimum of six grand just to rent the thing. And then on top of he's got to pay yeah, me. Yeah. But, so, so he's getting me plus the rental cost for, for a low cost. So in that sense, it's good. And if you've got those clients who you think are gonna, you're going to get one of those a month, then great, mm-hmm. it's definitely worth it. Go go for it, and you're going to absolutely love it. But if you're still, you know, working with these smaller clients who still only want to pay, you know, max, max, max a thousand pounds for a project, max thousand pounds for a project, then yeah, yeah. you're really not you're not going to earn your money back. It's not going to be a smart investment. With me, I, as I say, I'm trying to move more into the rental side of things as well. So it's like if I can rent it out for twenty days out of the month, and then for the re- the other ten, shoot on it when I can that would be good for yep. me because then it essentially starts paying itself off and then it's the same as doing a mortgage with a house you know you're just paying yourself right mm-hmm. um but yeah I, the, and the only other advice i would would say would be you know just get your hands on one and see whether or not you think it's really going to be worth it and don't 
you know, we all love picking up a cinema camera because it's like, oh, it's weighty and oh, look at that image quality and da da da. And it can be really easy to just go and be like, fuck it, I'm just going to buy one. But, you know, if you're really not going to use it that much, then then maybe it's not the best idea. And I, on, I mean, I'm sure you'll put Instagrams and stuff on here, but if anyone, you know, wants to have a chance to play around with one, if anyone does watch this and, and, and wants a chance to play around on a, on a red, I'm more than happy to, to, to let them to let them play around with mine and see whether or not it's worth worth it for them. Yeah, nice so, one. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, like, I've never touched a red camera. Mm. Um... But, yeah, it's kind of always been the dream. You know, like, yeah. when I see, like, photos of, like, Jacob Owens on Instagram, of mm. him, like, with a red over his shoulder, or, like... Yeah. Um, That's the same as me. I That's don't know. the exact same. Yeah. That was the, sa- that was the same dream I had, you know? And it, it's... The only way I can describe it is it's, like, you know when you've been waiting for... You know when you've been waiting for something to come in the post from Amazon for, like three days and it and it's something technology wise and you get it and you like play around with it for the first 10 minutes and you're like fucking oh, this is the best thing in the world and then a week later you forgot you even own it that's the yeah, exact yeah. way is it's that whole feeling like you want it and you need it and then you get it and then you're like oh actually really i don't need it that much and it's fine when the it's fine when you've only paid 100 pounds for it but if you've paid 26 grand 26 20 to 28 grand for one it's quite yeah, a different yeah. it's quite a different uh different feeling but you know I, again i don't re- i don't regret buying it i'm i'm glad that i own it uh this i yeah, feel like man. with the whole coronavirus stuff um hopefully i will be able to brainstorm more ideas of how i can monetize it um uh but that that you know in my previous experience i've never had to reach out to people and be like if you need a videographer you should book me because i'm i do videos whereas in this this scenario with the business side of things, I am going to have to start reaching out to people and being like, by the way, this is what I have. This is what it may be useful for, for your project, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah. Okay. No, fair play. Well, it sounds good that you're, like I said, you're willing to own it and use it for the right projects, but yeah. you're also willing to admit when it's overkill. Mm. And shoot on but your the, A7. There's, there's really great. I mean, honestly, there's really great YouTube videos which are, you know, the the title is "Do I need? Do you need to buy a red? Should I buy a red?" Da, da, da. And they say they'll see. You'll see they'll say exactly the same thing as I do after owning one for six months. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's really really enticing when you are when you have one in your hand because you're like because for us it's it's the equivalent of owning a Volkswagen Golf and then being asked if you want to buy a Ferrari and you get in the Ferrari and you're like fuck I really want this Ferrari but if you're <laughs> only but if you live in London you don't need a Ferrari. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I've the, got the um, I've got the Black Magic pocket cinema camera. Ooh, how are we finding that? Uh, where are you? There you are. Oh. Um, yeah. I mean, so well, I was kind of like, obviously, my my Canon 1DX Mark II and this. I wanted to kind of have my everyday stills camera, video camera with autofocus that mm. I can rely on. It's weather sealed. It's never failed me, literally never on a shoot, yeah. is it just like packed out or anything? Yeah. Um, but then I wanted something else that, like I said, I needed something that didn't have a record limit because, you know, if I'm mad. shooting an interview, if I'm shooting an interview and I have to stop and start the recording every half an hour, yeah. Heiner defeats so, the purpose of a video camera. I, I'm so surprised that that's even the case. Like I've, 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 I'm thinking yeah. about it. I don't, I don't film on Canon, so I wouldn't guess. But I mean, the Sony, I've never ever had a problem with. It's never, it never cuts out or anything during interviews. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, so, I think Sony might have fixed that. I don't know, but it's basically to do with the uh, the European tax law on how they tax video cameras. That's so mad. So for them to claim it is not a video camera there has to be that restriction that so is, silly right that's ridiculous but yeah the black magic but, pocket um, um the image is great like it's super sharp the the codecs are really lovely like you can film in uh the black magic raw and prores which is yeah. like a dream um mm. you can shoot like raw videos to an sd card 
It's got loads of flexibility. Yeah. I mean, just just go. And just the files are small; like they're easy to handle. You know, like honest at me. Just going, just going back to the whole owning a red thing. That is yeah. a really, really big thing that you really have to think about when buying one. Is the size of the files are fucking huge? Like they're enormous. They're enormous, yeah, and you, you know, it's it, it's almost unmanageable for someone who is is, yeah, yeah, is, is, is is used to shooting on Sony SD cards, Sony SD cards or Canon can CF cards or whatever. Um, it is just a completely different ball game. And I mean, I've shot, you know, just even just filming Budapest for two days. I mean, that was two and a half terabytes. Yeah, and you've got, I mean, got, like, it sounds very similar to the One DX. Yeah. Yeah. The difference is and the One DX doesn't shoot raw. Yeah, and I mean, well, I mean, having, the One DX three does, but yeah, yeah, and I mean, having the raw functionality is really, really good. Like, it's good to have that that in post. Like, it's do you it's do you shoot raw though? Yeah. How often do you shoot raw? You do. Okay. Every good. every t- every t- every project. Yeah. Cool. Um, it's just, and also the other thing as well, which you kind of, I didn't really know when I purchased it was, um when you when you shoot on a Sony or a Canon or whatever and you've got you're filming in 1080p you know this is what you get from that that image right this is the size yeah, of yeah. Your, your view this is your field of view if you jump to 4k you still get that field of view you just get it in 4k it doesn't go any wider yeah, yeah. you just that you have that with the red if you shoot in 4k this is what you get but if yep. you want to da- if you want to downscale it to if you don't want to shoot in 4k and you want to shoot in 2k you cr- it gets cropped so you go from shoot it so I see it, if yeah. I'm, if I, yeah if I'm shooting on a 17 you know if I'm shooting on a 17 mil I'll get a full 17 mil if I'm shooting the 4k but if I don't want to shoot 4k because I, I don't need it for 4k if it's for YouTube or something and I want to shoot in 1080 the crop factor is bonkers it's like four F, it's like four times yeah yeah so you it's go called from, uh, you get, yeah yeah after you it's called it's called fucking annoying. It's, it's called, called a it's called a one to one pixel readout. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it kind of does the same thing on the Black Magic. Yeah, but there's a little bit of leeway in the sensor portion that you can shoot in. Yeah, but there are still some restrictions. Yeah, but yeah, unlike so, the Sony or the Canon. Yeah, it's gonna resample the image over yeah. the full sensor. Exactly, and it's 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 something that's very very key to deciding whether or not you think that's worth it. Because for me, what that now means is that if I want to get a wide shot, I have to shoot in four K. I have no option. Yeah. I I mean, it, granted, I don't have to shoot in raw. I can shoot in ProRes, but yeah, yeah. That I mean, you're still shooting in four K. It doesn't matter. So you're you're still getting crazy crazy file sizes. So that's why I shoot everything in four K raw. I edit the project and if I don't need the project anymore I scrap the footage because I don't yeah, as long as I, because just having you just can't have like you know 20 hard drives just sitting around with old footage on it because it's just there's just no point so it, unless it's a project I feel, feel like I'm going to go back to the other option sometimes is I just pull all the best bits out create one file and then just save it and, and then that's the best bits of the footage and I can always go back to it and I just delete the initial raw clips but yeah yeah that that's time consuming and it's whether or not you're you know wanting to do that i suppose it's kind of like the the hidden cost of a cinema camera right yeah 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 100 percent. and also in, you know in like, my eyes if you're having mm-hmm. to spend so much money on media or even you're having to spend so much time transcoding the files yeah because you were forced to shoot in 4k yeah um it's kind of a hidden cost that they don't yeah. really tell you at the time yeah, but yeah. and it's and, it, and it, if you think that your computer will be able to handle it, expect for it not to be able to handle it and for you to have to upgrade because that's what I had to do. I mean, I had a 5K, uh, 5K iMac from 2016 or something like that. Um, and okay. it was spec to the absolute max. Like on Sony footage, it would run through like butter. As soon as I put the 4K um, red footage on it, it just couldn't handle it. So I had to sell both my computers and buy a new 16-inch MacBook, which was also spec to the match, max, which is four and a half grand. And it, that can handle it, but even that is not going to be what what uh, a cinematographer is used to editing on. They're going to be editing yeah, yeah. The, the iMac Pro. Well, it's with, not as smooth as you'd like, right? No, yeah. Well, I mean, unless unless you've got an iMac Pro and you've got like eight terabytes worth of RAM, 
it's going str- to it, like whatever computer you have is going to struggle and the other thing as well is when you're it, everyone's like oh it's cool because you can just tra- transcode the footage but if you're transcoding two terabytes worth of footage that's going to give you an extra terabytes worth of transcoded media and on top of that it can take a day for it to even transcode it it, it takes longer forever than that. So, literally so, takes yeah, forever yeah yeah so if you're working on a project and someone's like cool yeah can you turn it around within the next two days it's almost embarrassing to be like well, it's going to take me a day to render it. And they're like, I don't even know what that means. So <laughs> that's, that's something to think yeah. about. It, it needs to be, it definitely, it definitely needs to be the bigger projects that you're thinking of. And you need to allow a good three or four days to go through the footage, to even start to look at putting an edit together. So it's definitely something yep. to bear in mind. Yeah, yeah, I mean, going back to your thoughts on that you should probably rent or borrow mm. or at least get your hands on the camera before you buy it 100% because you yeah. might you might buy a red thinking you know this is going to be the greatest thing and then a week in you realize that yeah you can't shoot you can't shoot uh anything lower than 4k that isn't the full sensor yeah and which is definitely yeah it's a problem I had yeah yeah, yeah. and then you have to shoot everything in 4k and then you have to buy a new laptop you have to buy a new hard drive yeah, you have to buy and, and, all and, this mate, media, every, you know. It, like, it, yeah, and and every ever as soon as you upgrade your camera to a more expensive camera, the accessories get more expensive as well. So you go from you go from being able to true, shoot yeah. on a on a Ronin S, which is worth fourteen hundred pounds, to needing a Movi rig, which is eight grand. Well, unless you've factored that cost into your initial buying, um, that's it. You know, yeah, it, it then then it means all you can do is shoot handheld, which is not the worst. It's kind of like, more, but, it, but yeah, it's definitely it's true. limiting. It's definitely limiting, it's especially like the if you're more, shoot. on the bigger projects. If you need steady, if you need it to be steady, then you're, yep. you're a bit fucked. I see. It, yeah, but it's like you know, the more money you spend, the more money you spend. Yeah. Like I remember my first kind of well, most expensive camera. Well, not most expensive now, but the first time I spent a reasonable amount of money on a camera was the Canon One DC, which mm. is basically the Canon Cinema. 1D before the 1DX Mark II. Right. It was okay. discontinued by the 1DX Mark II. So more or less the same thing. Yeah. Um, without the autofocus and with C log. Just a bit of a right. weird mix, but that is um, weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I paid like two thousand six hundred pounds for that camera, and I loved it. You know, great little camera, did the job. And then I needed to have it serviced one day because I think I used like a dodgy third party battery yeah and I killed the camera like just it was black like the screen oh. went off and nothing happened yeah um, so I took it in for repair and it was a thousand pounds just to replace like the one board to power yeah. it back up yeah but that's why that's why I mean I've I, I've always been quite bad with insurance and never really got it on a lot of my cameras because i've always been like oh yeah, anything yeah. Goes wrong, if anything goes wrong with it at least it's cheap but when you're going for like these huge cameras for, like the repair cost to, uh, can be you know thousands it, thousands, yeah. thousands so or i don't know like even i don't know like um i i ruined a 1dx mark ii as well shooting a nightclub funny enough oh really how um lasers laser burn ah uh, see i yeah, do you know yeah. i had this i had the exact same thing happen to me a few weeks ago and luckily my uh, the warranty was still in luckily on i was the a7 uh, on the a7 III. luckily oh, my, okay. it, it was still within the two years consumer law warranty so i was able to take it to fixation and get it fixed but had i not that would have been another 800 pounds and that was because i've been so used to shooting in laser situations i was i, yeah. I just thought i was immune i honestly thought i was immune i was like there's no fucking yeah, yeah, laser absolutely. Seven. and then one day i went to film a job and uh was doing the got to the post process and started doing the editing and there was dead pixels all over and i was like <laughs> no thank, thank god it wasn't your red though right like uh, uh, yeah exactly but I have take, you but, take, I, right? but, but, but the first day I got the red I did take it to a nightclub and I shot a nightclub on it and then and oh. just because I was so excited I wanted to shoot something on it so I took that it that could have been an expensive mistake right that, uh, yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> but yeah Fair, anyway. cool um, <laughs> well let's move on to um, what's it like to live in London yeah, London's great. Um, it's a it's a hub for everything. Like, I mean, you're going to get more work here than anywhere else. If you if you do live in London and you're thinking of moving into the videography stuff, feel free to drop me a message. I mean, it's um, I work 
along i mean i'm in a in a whatsapp group with probably another 20 videographer photographers um and we all just yeah, kind nice. of share, share ideas speak about the industry kind of like especially with this whole uh self-employment stuff at the moment with coronavirus like we're all like chatting about how you know everyone jumping onto universal universal credits how this self-employed stuff is gonna all the 80 uh, percent payment thing is all going to help us and just kind of all helping and it's really good i mean i went through a, a lot a lot of videographers go through a good few years where it's literally just you on your own and you don't want yep. to get advice and reach out to other videographers and and tell them that you're shooting at these places and tell them this is how much you're charging because unless you trust them you don't know whether or not they're going to undercut you or or this kind of stuff um yeah yeah but after ha- if you put together a group of videographers who are all um, in a similar boat, some will work more than others, but still all yep. in the similar boat. You'll see that actually everyone is just trying to help each other out, and a lot, you know, any jobs that I can't do go straight onto that group, and I don't, I don't take a commission from it. I don't, and I make sure, like, I we put the group together about like kind of the middle of last year, um, and we made sure like that if you're offering a job, it can't be, it, you know. If, you, if it's that person's client, you go directly to the client. It's not through any invoicing. So for example, if a client said to me, okay, we've got a thousand pounds for this job. I don't send someone in for 200 quid and pocket 800 quid. Like we make sure it's like, no, you will invoice the client directly. They know how much money you're getting. And that way it keeps it fair for everyone. Everyone trusts each other. Yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, so um, it's London's a good place if you if you want to become a videographer because there's just so much work. I say there's probably thirty, there's 20, somewhere between twenty and thirty of us, and all of us are working, which is incredible because if you think about the amount of jobs that is, you know, if each person's taking on fifty jobs, a, sorry, five jobs a month, you know, that's that's a lot of jobs yeah, yeah. going. So um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's good. It's busy. There's lots of lots of work around, but again, it's just all about getting yourself in there and networking, finding the right clients. Um, yeah. Is the majority of the work you you take is it all in London? Like you don't have to travel outside of London for um, it. The only time I take work outside of London is for anything corporate. Um, right. The only reason. The only reason because it's easy to, easy to track. Like it's um, the money is covers the travel costs or, or yeah, the yeah. clients the clients who want you to leave London they're more willing they're, they'll be like okay cool we'll, we'll pay for your accommodation we'll pay for you for you to get around and stuff um, yeah, yeah. like I, I wouldn't go all the way to you know Surrey to go shoot a nightclub you know just there just wouldn't be any point um, unless the money was good enough yeah I mean unless the money was good enough if someone was like well, but it never to, would be <laughs> So it, it, happ- it happens sometimes. I mean, one of my one of my friends just posted. One of the guys in the group just posted like, "Oh, we've got a job in Birmingham. It's to film a video for a nightclub. It's three hundred and fifty pounds, and they'll pay for your train there and back. If you've got nothing to do that weekend, go have a look at Birmingham. Why not? Something to do. Yeah, isn't absolutely. It? But yeah, like those jobs are, are a rarity. And I mean, I, if you live outside of London, there's going to be less competition, but there's also going to be less jobs. So it, it kind of depends on what your you know the rent here is extortionate it always has been it's only ever going to get worse so yeah my my rent my rent in itself is a thousand pounds a month most other people i know who live outside london it's 400 pounds a month so (laughs) i'd say yeah that's about right yeah and you've got and you've Um, got to know if you you've got to know if you want to live in london it's a completely different experience to living outside of it you know but some people love it absolutely I, i i personally i'm not the biggest fan of london like i don't mind living here I like that that everything's on my doorstep. That's great, but I'm, I'd rather live somewhere that's sunny, you know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'd, ra- I'd rather you, live somewhere. Do you think that's... you earn? Do you do you think you earn more money living in London, or are the costs of living in London? Do they kind of balance out how much you earn to how much you spend? I th- I, um, I think that you probably would. I think, I think the costs of, of, of the job uh, are probably similar living inside or outside of London. I would say, but I think that right. the fact that I think the fact the fact that you would work more in London, in my opinion, I, I, I know a few people who live outside of London. Yourself being, um, I know a few people who live outside who, you know, um, will probably they'll probably earn the same amount but they would probably work a little bit less that's the only thing I would say so you're working yeah. more you're working more which makes the cost justifiable but uh, you know yeah fair enough it depends it depends if you 
like want to live in London, I guess. That's what I would say. One sec. Guys, can you not shout? I'm still recording. Mate, how long will you be? It's isolation time. About, I know, exactly. That's why I'm just... I can't. I've, I've already set up. To... There isn't an office. You made me move. Well, go see the spare room. <laughs> Mate, I'm, I'm only going to be another like 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, cool. Um, but yeah, London, you think you'd recommend it for other video creators? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. If you, I mean, if you want to, if, sorry. Um, yeah, like if you, if you're, if you're, if you're wanting to become a videographer and you already live in London, I mean, it's the perfect place to start. Yeah, yeah. Is there a lot of competition in London for yeah. the right kind of work? Yeah, there definitely is. There definitely is, but I, I guess it's just about uh, it's just about being honest, really. Like, just try and. I mean, I'm I'm always honest with the people that who I meet, like who are other videographers. If I ever if I ever meet photographers, videographers in in clubs and stuff, I don't. I would never try and undercut someone's job or anything. I think yeah, that's the way man. to be. That, cool. That's the way to be. I mean, like for me, it's. Um, I, what I meant was like, is there a lot of competition in London because there are so many more video creators around? Meaning, if do you feel like you have to kind of beat someone else on their price for a client, or they're going to go elsewhere? Not really. I try. I try not to be that harsh. You know. Yeah. Um, no. I, yeah. Fair play. I mean, yeah, I don't they, mean they, people you know. I mean, the client will just find someone else. That's kind of their. Yeah, it definitely happens. But I mean, you just gotta. The, the, the everyone barters for what they do, right? So it's like if a yeah. if a client if a client turns around to you and says, "Oh well, you know, this is what we want done," and you give them what you what you would imagine it was going to cost, and then they go, "Okay, cool. Well, that's not in our budget. So can you work something out?" There's definitely an element of trying to trying to meet in the middle. Because it, yeah, because yeah. they don't. At the end of the day, they don't want to have to go and keep looking for people. They just want to get someone books and get it done. If it's That's if, true, you know, if you if you go in and say, "Cool, my price is a thousand pounds," and they go, "Okay, well, we've only got a budget for five hundred quid." Unless you're willing to go down to that, then you can just be like, "No, nah, it's just not going to be worth my time." Which is often what I do. Is just like it's going to take me two or three days to edit this, so I'm not going to, you know, I have to think about how what my time's worth. But then. If if I go in and say thousand, they say okay. Well, we're we're thinking more seven hundred. Be like okay, cool. Well, I mean, let me go for eight hundred. See if they'll take it. And then yeah, of course, cool, two hundred quid that you are missing out on. But still, it's a it, it's a job that's not going to go to someone else. Yeah, um, but, I know what you mean. but quite but again, quite quite often there'll be a job that I'll, I'll say a thousand for. They'll say five hundred, and I'll be like, I'm not going to do it for that because it's just not worth my time. But I know someone yeah, who yeah. actually will do, will do that because it's worth it for them. So it just depends on where it depends on where you're at in your journey, I suppose. Yeah, no, I hear like, what you're I mean, where I where I'm where I live in Southampton, um, I don't know, like, because I've, I've never lived in London, I can't really compare it. But from what I've seen, because I I do a lot of work in London, and I have to travel into London a lot mm. for client work. Mm. Um, but from my experience, I've found while there's not that much going on in Southampton, there is just enough to keep me busy and to yeah, keep me good. employed mm. and there's very little competition i found yeah which is great like you know even which as a really video good. creator who you know i'm always trying to network and mm. find everyone doing uh something in the city mm. i can only count probably five or six people that i could hire for a job in my entire city here yeah but that's always good so it's, it's yeah so i think at least yeah, and I mean, and, and because Southampton's a student town as well, it's full of kind of things that are happening, but mm. people don't want to hire students. Yeah. Or at least I don't want to hire students. I'm just going to roll that? the camera. I'm just going to roll the camera quick again. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, you, you can hire students, and if you get a if you find the right person you can um you know you can get a good deal but majority of the time they won't they won't deliver mm. they'll they'll either turn up late they <coughs> will lose the files they'll fuck the project up in some sense which was me yeah. once upon a time absolutely you know that was just me a few years ago yeah um but yeah i just found that you know clients don't specifically they don't want to hire students just because they're cheap 
So I yeah. found that just being That's good, that though. small level above what the students are um, has meant there's not that much competition going. That's good. That's pretty good. It's good yeah, not bad. Not bad. That's it. That's it. That's that's similar. They're similar in London, though. To be fair, like not a lot of people want to hire students, but like, as students, but they'll hire them once they've said, "I'm a videographer." You know. I see. Once they've had a bit of experience, yeah. yeah. Um, so moving on to coronavirus. Tell me yeah. about how the coronavirus has affected your work. Um, and tell me about how you've been keeping busy yeah. uh, amongst amongst it all. Amongst the madness. Um, yeah, so basically I, I was, um, I had a big job in January, big job in February, and then I kind of wanted to take a little bit of a break. I was supposed to go to South Africa on the 9th of March for a month. Oh, wow. I was supposed nice. to go, to, yeah, for, but that's just literally on a holiday. And oh, then, okay. And um, then... And then basically I had that time in between and I didn't have many bookings um, booked in for the two weeks after I got back. So I was just like, do you know what? I'm going to go on a ho- another holiday. So I went to Bali with my, girl- with my girlfriend for her birthday and uh, we just kind of went there and we were starting to hear about it, but we did not think anything, it was going to be anything as big as this. So we, I just thought, go on holiday for two weeks, come back. And the three weeks that I had in between the end of Bali and the beginning of South Africa were packed i literally was working if not every other day like every single day for most of those weeks mm-hmm. so so it was going to be a really really good good and that's the reason why i decided to go to bali because i was like fuck it i'm gonna have loads of work I'll, I'll, I'll do that anyway obviously went to bali and shit hit the fan while i was in bali and then it was like and then after that it was just like client cancel client cancel client cancel until obviously everything is closed now so literally yeah, yeah. no work at all so yeah the bad news is that yeah cool this has all happened. I'm not working. I'm just chilling at home with my girlfriend. I've got a few little bits of remote work here and there, which is mainly just like editing, a little bit of animation stuff. But other than okay. that, like no, nothing crazy. The good news is that most of those jobs have been not cancelled but postponed. So postponed. I know. Yeah. I know. It's I know that when. The, yeah. So I know that when this all calms down, we're back to normal. Those jobs are still there. Um, so that's the good news. The other good news is with the whole self, 80% for the self-employed, I seem to be covered just about, which is good. So at least I know I'm not spending my savings because that was where the issue was going to be was like what I thought was going to happen is they're just going to be like no support for self-employed people. And then you're just eating into your savings for three months. So luckily I am covered. Luckily I am covered by that. So that will get paid in June, which is good. But yeah, other than that, um, no work at all really other than the few little bits here and there. Um, but at least kind of covered to an extent. Um, so yeah, so with my time off, I'm just just chilling, really. I think which I think what, what I saw this really cool quote which my friend posted, uh, which I posted on my Instagram earlier, which is like, um, not gonna lie, I thought going on lockdown was gonna be hard. However, I've never seen the earth look so beautiful. The sky's blue. The sun shines through my window every day, and people are working out virtually together, supporting one another. So there's pros and cons right like I've I've said this earlier like I don't ever remember a day where the sky has been just blue every day and it's been sunny yeah I know right and I don't know whether or not that's just complete coincidence that randomly it's sunny but it just seems like now all the cars are off the road now all the cars are off the road oh god (laughs) stop oh oh, liar it did stop recording fuck my camera Um, I'll carry on don't worry but yeah it just seems kind of crazy that yeah, like now every, all the yeah. cars off the road and everyone's the first, together. The first, week, the first week we have in quarantine has been the nicest weather we've had all year. Yeah. We probably will have all year. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's like beer garden weather and none of us are allowed to go to the, bit, to go to the pub. I know. It's a shame. Yeah, cool. so... Well, um, so, yeah. That's it, What really. are your... How do you think the coronavirus is going to have a knock-on effect on our industry? Um, I think that... <laughs> I think that for, for the people who can save, save themselves, like, as in the people who can keep their head above water for the next three months, I think that, that June, July, May, June, July and August are just going to be crazy for everyone, which is great. I think, honestly, it's, it's, it's a good thing. It's not good that for the next three months none of us are working and we're all sat on our asses doing nothing, but it's a good chance, yeah, for, yeah. Us to be, good chance for us to be creative. And, you know, I know uh, one of my um, 
friends Lewis, whose uh, his Instagram is Spin City Visuals, I think it is. Um, you know, he added me into a, a, he's adding me into a WhatsApp group, and it's like every day he's gonna like spin this virtual wheel, and whatever it comes up on, you have to make a. 30 second video on it like stuff like that is kind of keeps you busy yeah that's a nice and, idea yeah yeah cool for filmmakers me and, um, most... me and my brother did a 30 second video competition where uh, well I went home to visit my family where he lives uh, a few weeks ago this is before things really kicked off but um, yeah we just said you've got an hour to make a 30 second video it can be on anything there are no rules you get half yeah. hour to edit it um, and we came back with these to two totally different projects and it was just so fun to like try and force myself to do something in such a small little window of time but yeah, yeah I think yeah. people have been pretty creative in how they spend their time uh, and make some use of all this time yeah. off it's yeah, good. I mean, and people you know they get to chill because I imagine there's not a lot of time for that you know normally this time of the year so yeah i think you're right there's been some sort of silver lining in this Madness. in this quarantine yeah I, I think and i found the first few days i was bored out of my mind but the, the more i'm yeah. like planning things to do like the more i'm like okay cool well tomorrow i'm gonna do this this and this and then i yeah. do it and then and then i'm like okay what what else have i got on the list of things that i could do in the next few days and then i'm just like planning days it makes it way easier to get through having so much time on your hands yeah it really um, does and I for, think for, I think it's kind of like I don't know for me I've, I've actually found I've been more productive mm. I've yeah. been forcing myself to post to Instagram yeah I've been exercising for an hour a day which was never the case you know yeah well, that, so it's that, kind yeah, of funny how that na now I'm just using this time as an, a, a time to just like chill relax like I normally would do like say three or four months of work and then go on holiday for a month and decompress. I'm just like using this time to decompress and chill, catch up on a bit of work, make sure everything's in order so that when it's suddenly like, okay, cool, we can all go back to clubs and bars and restaurants. That's going to go crazy. That's all, all of a sudden, all of these companies are going to have that money that for their marketing budgets to suddenly start creating videos and, ha and, and have all this kind of stuff going on. So I'm just using these That's next it. few months as, as a, as a, yeah, I mean, a time to chill. Nice. I mean, the bit that kind of scares me, though, is that, for one, we have no idea how long this is going to last. I mm. mean, the kind of idea is that we'll be sort of over this in a month or so. Yeah. But that's what I'm, that's looking what I think. at the, yeah, looking at the, the growth and how little we knew two weeks ago compared to now, yeah. Yeah. I wonder, is this a much longer problem? Process. Yeah. I yeah, think it's than we're... I would, I would imagine, I mean, what my hope is, is that by the end of these 21 days, they're going to be like, okay, people can just at least walk in the streets now and there's no issues. And then give it another maybe month, two weeks to a month, they'll then be like, okay, cool, businesses can open, which means that everyone can reopen and be business as usual. That's my yeah. idea. That's my ideal. But it might be that we're all stuck inside for three months. And if that is the case, yeah. how do we keep, how do we keep ourselves, en ourselves entertained? And there's definitely going to be different just it's just we're, you're, you're seeing it already like people are being creative i don't i don't think i need to see any more gym videos live gym videos but um it's yeah I know. It's, it's cool seeing all the new things that people are coming up with definitely um that's it but, I, I, but yeah I, I i think that after after this is all said and done it's going to be a really really busy time for us all um that's so is, anyway the way well, i hope hasn't let's hope it hasn't way, made yeah. every every one of our clients bankrupt no, I don't. To the point I, I think, where they can't hire us anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the way the way I see it is that off instead of having three months of fairly steady work, we'll have three months of nothing, and then three months of really really intense work. And every but it, the other thing is you might lose out on jobs just because you just don't have enough time in the day, which is often what yeah. I find in what I often well, find like you in were saying, summer. Yeah, you were saying the, the summer is intense as it is. Yeah, so, so it's it's very possible it's going to kind of carry we're going to have way. to probably give up give up so much work right yeah but that's what that's cool why it's and there's good. also that's why it's good to yeah, yeah. know that's why it's good to know other videographers and photographers who are at a certain level because it's good to be able to be like i can't do this job but if you want it this is now the time that i can give it to you because 
if you're not going to be able to do the job anyway, it's better for you to send someone who you trust to go and do it for you. Yeah. Because at least you know the quality Definitely. isn't going to, at least you know the quality is not going to lose you the client essentially, you know? Yeah, or, you know, they might gain a client or the two of you might gain a client. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it happens. But yeah, something I thought about, something I thought about, um, that's not necessarily anything to do with our clients, but um, there are going to be delays in, like, camera gear now, aren't there? That's why I'm glad I got one that red. (laughs) Yeah, I know. It's probably saved yeah. you some money, to be fair, isn't it? Yeah, no, there, there is, there is going to be. I mean, I'm not planning on upgrading anytime soon, so yeah. So I'm, I'm. See, I'm I've been really of, excited for the Canon R5, which got announced in like March. Yeah, yeah. You know, full full frame, 8K, um, 45 megapixel sensor, mirrorless, autofocus, everything you'd want in a camera. It, 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 impa- on paper is the perfect camera on, on paper yeah. um but I, I i mean the olympics has been cancelled so yeah i mean i'm you know di- that's the cast mean, cannons like market isn't it yeah I, I was fairly disappointed with the first one um i had a i had a play around with i had a play around with it when they re- released the first canon esr the um, esr yeah yeah i i had a play around with it when they first brought it out i can't say i was too impressed with it i didn't think it was I didn't see any image quality difference between, say, shooting on the the Mark the One DX Mark Two, um, and I just found the whole ergonomics of it like I just didn't. It didn't feel like a nice camera in your hand. Yeah, which I think is really I mean, important. Yeah, I think it's just the convenient camera, isn't it? Like, my brother yeah. went from the A Seven Three to the EOS R. Yeah, and he's been loving it because mm. even though he's had to give up slow mo and four K, um, he no longer has the color grade. He just clicks record and it looks the way he wants. And really, yeah, mm. yeah, interesting. I don't know, two different markets, but um, I think they, yeah, it's, it also might be that I didn't give it that great of a chance. But I oh, definitely yeah, absolutely, yeah. I, I think, like you were saying, you got to really get your hands on a camera and use it on a few projects to realize what it can and can't do. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But uh, yeah, I think the EOS R five they've had a bit of time to mm. really find what people are after and this yeah. might be the camera it might not it's, de- it's, de- it's definitely a good consumer and prosumer camera um I, I still i still struggle to to understand how they could fit in something that would be say red quality or ari quality into such a small body yeah so that so i'm still i um, in my head i'm still like it's still not a bad decision that i have the red because i still feel like no matter what they put in that camera they're never going to be able to make it small enough to create the same quality yeah i don't think but, it will replace cinema cameras but yeah. it will well, definitely be a real nice b camera to a cinema camera yeah i agree i mean they're not going to make it replace their own re- own cinema cameras right so yeah but that's what yeah. i find that i find that also very weird like i mean i've tried c100s and c300s and I, I again with those i just didn't i just don't get the same quality that you get out of a out of say a red or an array I just haven't seen it. But my friend, my friend Harry, I say Harry Russell, he's he's got um, C three hundred. I think he's got C three hundred. He's got the C two hundred. C two hundred, and it, it, the quality of his work is incredible. But he knows the ca- that camera back to front, and his grading is second to none. So it really That's is it. about it really is about what you do with the footage as well as what you're shooting. I think because his stuff's great, really good. Absolutely, man. Um, let me finish this off with a few rapid fire questions. Cool. Interesting. So I stole this Ooh. idea from um, the podcast I mentioned earlier about, um, yeah, it's called the, the Golden Hour by Dave Mays. Okay. Um, and he just asked a load of like random rapid fire questions. Sure. And I don't know, here are the ones I come up with. Um, cool. Okay. Okay. Summer or winter? Summer. Sony or Canon? Sony. Red or Ari? Ari. Mac or PC? Mac, always. iOS or Android? iOS. Oh, who uses Android? Yeah. <laughs> You're not wrong. Uh, Facebook or Instagram? Instagram. Bad audio or bad video? Oh. Uh, bad audio. So you'd rather have bad audio? Depends what situation it's in. Okay. 
It depends um, on situations. In. Obviously, obviously, in the in the situation of like a yeah, of, yeah. Like, of like a testimonials video, it's got to be the audio has to be better. But is it you can okay. always no, you can always normally you can always normally do a little bit of sound design. But if you've got bad video, you have fucked. You know. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Xbox or PlayStation? I just bought PlayStation like three days ago, so it's got to be PlayStation. <laughs> fair play. Uh, self-employed or employed? Self-employed. Primes or Zooms? Primes. Wide or tight lenses? Wide. Love wide. Love a good wide lens. Yeah, good man. Um, resolution <laughs> or frame rates? Frame rates. Sensor Cut. size or dynamic range? Dynamic range. Gimbal or handheld? Um, I'm going to get handheld. Uh, beer or spirits? Beer, always. Speaking of sp- speaking of which, we need to go for a beer when all this Corona shit is <laughs> so far. Let's go for many, I think. Yeah. Um, and then finally, pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Fair play. Spe- nice. Speaking of which, I really fancy some pancakes now. <laughs> nice. Um, Cool, I think that brings us to an end then, mate. Unless you've got cool, any man. final advice for any up-and-coming creators? No, I, I, um, I, I think we've touched on like so much good stuff today. Um, the, like, the only thing I would say is just don't feel like you can't jump into it and do it. Obviously, make sure you've got a bit of financial backing and be prepared f- for you to have to build that client base. But there's so many um, you know, people like me and you on instagram who are doing this whole self-employed lifestyle and whether or not we have bad months or good months like i would never um not i would never not give advice to someone who needs it um and don't feel don't feel afraid to ask um it's half of my career has been me asking other videographers stupid questions um you know and it's it, they are stupid questions to you but to other people they're not that and it's what that one question can completely change your workflow so yeah feel free to reach out to other videographers because you'll mo- mostly you'll find that people are pretty pretty cool and will give you advice and and help you out the best way, best they can i'm i'm pretty chill and i just if anyone needs anything i'll, I'll do my best so yeah nice one cool well um cool. yeah i think that brings us to a close thank you very cool, much man. thanks for, for being me. my guest today jake um, thank you for having me you can find links to my and Jake's socials in the show notes. Feel free to subscribe and follow any of our work. Please do get in touch if you had any thoughts about what we've spoken about today. And until next time, thanks for listening to Let's Talk Video. Let's talk video.